Okay, so um, today, my name is Cindy Cron. If I didn't catch me earlier on um, when we did the introductions, I'm the IPM advisor for the North Coast. So I cover Sonoma, Napa, Lake and Mendocino counties. Um, and today I'll be talking about um, olive fruit fly. So um, to get started, California produces approximately 99% plus of the olives grown in the US. So pretty much majority of the olives grown in the US are out of the state of California. Um, and that's uh, in 2021, that was approximately 36,000 acres. Uh, we bring in a little over 100,000 tons of fruits um, and it e equates to more than $85 million annually. And that's according to the California Crop Report in 2021. Um, and this does fluctuate from year to year. Uh, so in 2021, uh, we did see a 49% increase um, in California production. Um, talking about all the fruit fly specifically, uh, the distribution of this pest insect, um, as you can see, is throughout Europe, Africa, Asia, Americas, in all of the olive uh, producing areas um, that you can see on the map. So it does have a very wide distribution um, and it can be found um, as an economic pest in, in olives um, throughout the Mediterranean kind of areas. So when we're looking at how do you identify olive fruit fly, there's a bunch of flies out in the field. So how do you know which ones are the actual olive fruit fly? Um, and adults are approximately 0.2 inches. So that's about four to five uh, millimeters in length. Um, and they have these clear wings that you can see here with um, a little black uh, dark spot on the tip of the wings on both both uh, both sides of the wings. Um, males have females have an ovipositor, this uh, section that you can see that's sticking out here. This is where they lay eggs from. And males have more of a rounded um, abdomen, as you can see in this photo. And they can range from mainly black to dark reddish brown. Um, so there, there is variation in, in, in some of their coloration. Um, they have their scutellum. So this is the scutellum is this little portion right here uh, is either cream to yellowish in color. And as you can see, it really stands out on the insect in the photos. And the face has two black spots. Um, if you look in between the eyes, you'll see these two black spots. And so these are some of the identifying features that you can notice um, when you're looking at traps or in the fields of which one is olive fruit fly. And once you get used to looking for olive fruit fly, they pretty much stand out um, with all the other insects that might be caught um, in a trap. So looking at the different uh, life stages, adults lay eggs in the olive fruit. And then the larva will emerge and they feed uh, on the inside of the fruit causing tunneling. So they tunnel through the fruit as they're eating. Um, and in those tunnels, you'll find rot uh, that will occur because they're depositing their frass or their poop as they're tunneling through the fruit. Um, and then um, fungi get in there and they start to rot the fruit. Uh, larva pupae in the olive or they drop to the ground to pupate in the soil. Um, so this is an insect that goes egg, larva, different stages of larva. So at each, each stage are getting um, a little bit larger. Uh, then they pupate, which is very much um, like what a butterfly does going from a caterpillar to butterfly. So they become a pupa and then they emerge as an adult. So the adults emerge from the soil in springtime and then um, they typically overwinter as pupae. Um, three to four generations per year. Infestations can lower um, olive quality and quantity. So definitely um, a pest of olives, whether it be table olives or olive oil olives, um, we can handle a little bit more infestation in olive oil olives compared to table olives, uh, but still, the, you know, it's just a little bit more. <laughs> Um, so these, these photos show the damage out in the field. So in this photo, A, a on the left-hand side, this is an olive that is undamaged. The one on the right has a sting, and that sting is where the female inserted her ovipositor, which we showed in the last photo, 
um, and, and inserts an egg inside of the olive. And as that larva emerge and starts to feed, this is the photo B in the middle, is what does it look like when the, that rotting starts to occur? Um, and then see when you cut open that olive, you can see frass, uh, which is their, again their poop, um, and rotting on the inside of the, uh, the fruit. So this of course affects the quality of oil produced um, and definitely you can't market it as a table olive, um, it's not edible. So definitely affects quality. Um, and so here are some photos of signs of olive fruit fly damage. So on the left-hand side, you can see how the fruit is misshapen and rotting um, and, and desiccated in parts. And then you can see these exit holes. So there's a hole here, a hole there, a hole there, hole there. You can see these holes, in, which are where the larva uh, emerge from, drop to the ground and pupate. So um, the, the, the uh, larval form is no longer in this olive um, at this point. Um, and then this uh, photos of early tunneling, uh, where you can see there, there's dark lines and you can see how it tunneled through the fruit. Um, and then as you, you as the larvae get larger, those tunnels become larger and a larger area that's rotting inside. So trapping, um, so well, we can cover how, how to hang traps. So you're gonna want to uh, place two traps per five to 10 acre block. Um, in fruiting trees by March 1st, uh, in warmer locations, you can do it a little bit later in cooler locations. And you place a trap in an area where the high uh, <clears throat> olive fruit damage is known to occur, or at least uh, one row or, or tree into the orchard. So it's not on the perimeter. Um, hang traps in mid canopy in a shaded area. So typically that's the north side of the tree, avoiding leaves that might block access to that trap. Um, so you don't want it like leaves all the way around. You do want some airflow, um, the ability for the insect to find the trap. Um, and then you're going to want to record the number of olive fruit fly weekly that are caught in each trap. And keep in mind that it's normal for olive fruit fly numbers to decline during the hot periods of the summer um, and increase when weather begins to cool. So we have three options for traps. McPhail traps uh, um, is the first one that we'll cover. McPhail's, you can see uh, the white and the yellow. Typically it's yellow, um, plastic. These also come in glass, um, which I've seen before. But this is one that I typically use in the fields. Um, you're gonna wanna place water in the bottom portion, this yellow portion with three to four uh, Cherulea yeast tablets, and then screw on the top so that top and bottom come apart. You put the water in and the tablets and screw it in. Um, and you're gonna wanna, again, hang in the mid canopy area on the shaded side of the tree. Um, to count the olive fruit flies, you empty the contents. I like to empty the contents into a labeled plastic container with a snap lid, and I transport it back to the lab. Um, and then I am empty that contain, um, container into a mesh strainer and then run water over it because the yeast tends to clump up over the insects. Um, so you want to run some water so then you'll be able to uh, determine which ones are all of fruit fly. Um, and I, I like to spread the insects out on a paper towel to sort. Um, now this might be seem like a lot of work. Uh, I do know that people do do it in the field where they will have a bucket and they empty it with a strainer and they empty the contents into the strainer and collect the bucket, run the water and then do the counts. Um, so you can see the photo on the left is what a typical uh, you know trap for a week uh, when I'm doing a study looks like. There, there are pros and cons to each way of trapping. One of the cons to this way of trapping is that you do collect a lot of insects that are not all a fruit fly. So as you can see the photo here, all these insects on the left-hand side are not all a fruit fly. And these were the olive fruit fly that I took out of um, the, this one trap. Um, so you are killing a lot of insects. Um, some of them, you know, you might not mind, uh, but others, it doesn't, um, you do get some beneficials in there. So that's something to think about. It's, it's not very selective. Um, 
So one thing to keep in mind, you do not want to dump the trap contents in the field. So that's why I like to put them in a container and bring them back into the lab to process in a sink. Um, but the, you don't want to just dump the, um, the true leaves you know, in the ground um, and, and redo the trap. You're going to need to collect that liquid and, and dispose of it outside of the field. The other option, uh, second option, is a yellow sticky trap with a lure. And so you have this yellow sticky trap that you fold um, the sticky part on the outside and they clip together on the bottom. Um, and then you can attach a lure, either a sex pheromone or ammonium bicarbonate. I, I use ammonium bicarbonate. You can use them together um, or you can use them just one or the other. Um, and you hang again in the mid canopy area on the shaded side of the tree. And you can just count the olive fruit fly directly um, from the trap itself. This is a photo of what a trap can look like at a peak of the season. Majority of those insects, again, on that trap are not olive fruit fly. Um, so it's something to keep in mind. Uh, you do collect a lot of other fruit flies, let alone other insects. Um, and you would want to replace the lure as directed by the manufacturer. Um, so usually that's every six weeks, but it really depends on what the manufacturer says. So the trap you're going to want to change out um, to the point in which, like this trap, you're not going to catch any more insects on this trap. So you want the trap to be effective. You want to be able to, to count um, what you're seeing. Uh, the other uh, trap type is the Olipe trap, um, and this is also baited with truly yeast. And you can actually make these on your own. So it's a one and a half to two liters of non-food plastic bottle and you drill several holes, four to five millimeter holes. So you can see in, in here, they drew they drilled some holes around the top portion um, of the bottle. And um, you're gonna place one liter of water in, in that bottle with three to four Truly yeast tablets. And you again, hang it, the, it in mid canopy on the shaded side of the tree. And to count the other fruit flies, it's similar where you're going to empty the contents into, I, again, plastic container with a snap lid for transport. You can do it in the field, but you need to make sure that you don't dump the trap contents in the field when you do it. Um, one of the benefits uh, of this style of trap, uh, you can make it yourself. Uh, so you don't have to um, purchase the trap. The other benefit is that these holes are meant to be um, just large enough that all the fruit fly can get in, um, but then you don't get a lot of beneficial insects like your bees or wasp also getting in because they the holes are too small for them to enter. So it's a little bit more selective um, in what insects can enter due to size, but you will get other insects in there. Um, but but you know you have to weigh it out, right? So in looking at uh, our data that we've had from a trial, looking at, um, I did sticky cars and McPhail traps in the same um, orchard. So I did not do the Olipe traps, but you can see that you generally are getting about the same, I would say sticky cards, you might be getting more earlier in the season where McPhail's you might be getting more later in the seasons at times, but um this is the difference in how they perform. Um, and you should, you know, if you haven't done trapping before, you should test it out and see which one that you like. Um, McPhail's are, are more messy, but sticky cards are sticky and they, they get glue everywhere. So you got to figure out what works for you um, and, and your system and what you're likely to um, be able to keep up with. So, um, Trapping benefits, you're able to document the olive fruit fly population over a season and over multiple seasons to compare, um, you know, am I able, am I reducing the number that I'm seeing from year to year? Um, so you're able to see the results of intervention measures. So in this graph, you can see this is the population over the season that we collected in traps. And each red um, arrow is when we applied a pesticide. So we applied and then the population got knocked down. Then it came back up, we applied, the population got knocked down. It started coming back up, we applied, the population got knocked down. So you can see um, how your intervention measures are affecting your population. 
Uh, reduction in population if it's mass trapping, but the caution really should be taken when um, choosing this approach. Traps are poor competition with the, the attraction of an, the actual olive fruit. So um, this should not be used as a standalone measure. Um, so, and one thing to keep in mind, there isn't a relationship with the olive fruit fly numbers found in the traps and the actual damage, which I know sounds weird, um, but we've seen that where you have high population, low damage, or low population and high damage. So um, one does not necessarily mean the other. So cultural controls for all the fruit fly, sanitation, sanitation, sanitation. Um, remove old fruit remaining on the trees following harvest and bury fruit on the ground at least four inches deep from tillage. And I know that's oftentimes not an option, but I'm putting it out there as if you did this, it would help. Um, and I understand most, most orchards are not being tilled, but just putting out that this is an option or take it to the landfill. Um, so when you allow the olives to remain on the tree or on the ground, um, there are, are olive fruit fly that have pupated in those olives and that's your, that's your um, beginning population for the next season. So if you're able to remove those out of your orchard, um, you're able to reduce the population naturally. Um, another big strong thing, uh, fruiting varieties of landscape trees and unmaintained ornamentals. Um, so uh, trees that are planted for aesthetic reasons, either in front yards or in vineyards, where they're, they're planted because they people like the way they look, um, but they aren't planning to harvest those olives or to maintain those olives. The, this is a significant source of olive fruit fly for invasion into commercial olive um, groves. Um, this, I know, I've seen this as an issue on, in the North Coast, maybe not so much in Central Valley, but um, putting it out there that there is an option. Um, there is a product called Olive Stop um, that be, can be used to treat the olive trees um, that will not be harvested to eliminate uh, reduced fruit sets. So you um, apply this when the olives are in full bloom, but before the fruit sets and during periods of extended bloom, more than one spraying might be necessary. Uh, but with warm temperatures immediately following, the application will improve its results. And basically by applying this acid, um, it helps reduce the fruit set. Um, less fruit are less, less available for the olive fruit fly. And if, if applied well and properly, um, you could have no olives on your tree or very few olives on your tree that could be uh, removed by hand. So this is something to keep in mind that, um, you know, especially in the North Coast where we have vineyards that butt up to commercial olive groves, uh, you know, the, the olives that are in say vineyards might uh, be a source of the insects for actual commercial production. Um, so our options, we don't have very many options to control all the fruit fly and olives. We have GF120, which is organic, Danatol, which is conventional, and kaolin spray, which is a deterrent. So the insect doesn't like it, but it doesn't reduce um, insect populations. Um, and so the more options are needed for growers to be able to properly rotate modes of action uh, to prevent pesticide uh, resistance from occurring. So I'm going to go briefly over three projects that we have done in the last three years. 2020, I worked with Bob Van Steenwick. He's an um, extension specialist emeritus out of UC Berkeley. And we tested three rates of Savanto um, against a sale, Danatol, and an untreated check. Um, and uh, this was just showing uh, the, the damage that we saw, but it, then this is really what you wanted to see, what worked better. So Danatol is our industry standard. This is uh, the conventional standard that is used. And so in comparison to that standard, Savanto performed better. Um, Savanto, that was our third round. I was on the third round. I was not a part of the first and second of trials um, testing Savanto for all the fruit fly. Savanto has now moved forward for registration with EPA. It is not registered. You cannot use it yet, but it is um, it is at the next step in the of the process. It's gone through the residue trials and efficacy trials and the paperwork is with EPA. So, um, which is exciting, it's moving forward. Um, hopefully in, in the future, we'll be able to offer another option for growers to use. 
In 2021, I teamed up. It was a CDFA funded project with Frank Zalem and Joanna Fisher, who's now with um, CDFA. And we tested entomopathogenic fungi, my control, sprayed on the soil in springtime when the adults are emerging from the soil to attack adults um, emerging. So th they did a couple years of lab studies, which you can see the photos here. Uh, th these are all the fruit fly that my control have attacked. Um, and up close, what does it look like when it attacks and the fungus attacks and kills them? Uh, we did have mixed results in the field though. And this is what happens sometimes when you get good results in a lab and you put it out in the field and there are a lot more uh, things going on. One being that it was a in the last year of the drought <laughs> um, and insect populations in general were just very low um, across the board. So um, this one did not go, we did see uh, positive results, but probably not enough that would um, make sense for a grower to spend the money on the mycotrol in order to implement. Um, so 2022, last year, I, I teamed up again with Bob Van Steenwick, um, and this time we tested two rates of MBI 306. Uh, it is now being called Bountify. Venerate, delegate, and trust Danatol again, the industry standard in an untreated check um, for control of all the fruit fly. Bountify, venerate, and, and trust are organic products. So we are also not just looking at conventional options, but organic options. And uh, exciting results, uh, preliminary results, of course, it's only one year of data. Um, as you can see here, MBI, the low and the high dose, the high dose performed the best. It performed better than Danatol. Um, and you can see here, we looked at tunneling and in total infested fruit. Tunneling was, is what affects olive oil production. Total infested are stings and tunneling put together, which affects is the 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 number you're looking for for table olives um, because you're not able to um, accept sting fruit that's been stung, where say olive oil can. Um, and so we we did separate these two numbers to show the differences. Um, <clears throat> but it is exciting that the high rate of uh, Bountify performed better than Danatol, which was your industry standard in that Bountify um, is also organic and it, per it performed better than a, a conventional um, insecticide. So we are moving forward again in 2023 to repeat this work, um, to try to get more data. Um, it looks promising, but again, that's one location, uh, one time. We, you, we need to repeat this multiple times in order to have the proper data to possibly move forward for registration. But it is promising and I'm excited by it. Um, so if you wanna learn more about olive fruit fly and olive pests and diseases, you can always go to IPM .ucanr.edu. This is what the page looks like when you when you land there. Um, there's a lot of information there for free. Um, and so when you get to this page, you would go to under identify and manage pests, scroll down to agricultural pests, you click on that. Then you can choose olive. So it gives you a list of crops, choose olive, go down to olive fruit fly. And as you can see, there's quite a few different um, insect pests. And if you go down, there's diseases. Um, and then there's a page that gives you a lot of information. So your description of the pest, the damage, management options, biocontrol, cultural control, organic options, monitoring, treatment decisions. So it is a, a wide range of free information um, that you can always refer to. Uh, the, the insecticides that I talked about with the acid that you can apply um, for olive stop, um, all that information and details about it are actually Actually on this page. Um, so again, it's ipm.ucanr.edu. And with that, uh, it looks like I have a few minutes to take any questions. Let me open up the Q&A box. Okay. What is the problem with disposal of Cherula yeast water from the trap in the field? So that truly yeast is an, is an attractant. Um, and so you then you're attracting them without trapping them. 
Um, so you're giving them a food, a food source. So, so they, they, can, they feed on truly yeast. Um, and that's why they're attracted to it. And so if you jump it in the ground, then they're attracted to where you dumped it. They're able to feed on it, but they're not being trapped. So it actually helps support that population. Um, and that's why you don't wanna dump that in the field. Um, is there an economic threshold level in traps or in olives to determine treatment? Good question. Um, so every location is different. Every orchard is different. The amount of economic damage you um, are able to sustain would be different than say the next person, especially if you're dealing the difference between high end olive oil or, or like where is the olive oil going? Or if it's table olives, you know, their, their level is way lower than olive oil olives. So um, what's important with trapping and trapping every season and keeping documentation um, of that trapping is being able to look from year to year. We had, you know, this was our, uh, our insect level last year and we had X number percentage of, of damage. Uh, I need to get that lower. So I'm looking for a lower population. So you need to really compare numbers from the same location uh, year after year. Um, so you're, you could have a lower population that um, historically has higher damage than say another location. Um, so, so you have to compare from your specific location. So there is not a set um, number that if you reach, you need to do something, um, but you need to come up with that number for your location specifically. Um, and again, it changes from location to location. Um, okay. Are olive fruit fly a threat to table olives in brine since the olives are underwater during brining? Um, olive fruit fly can't swim. They don't have a life form that can swim. If the olive fruit fly laid its egg and larva was in the fruit already, then you're gonna have dead larvae um, and eggs in the fruit. But I don't think that's what you're saying. I think you're asking if the olives are already under the water, can the olive fruit fly get to them? And that would be no. Kaolin clay is very effective as shown by Boston's study. Why no mention today? Um, I did mention it, John, in the very beginning uh, uh, when I was looking at our options and we have three options. So we have GF120, we have Danatol, and then we have kaolin clay. Um, it is, um, it can be very effective. There's pros and cons to anything that you use. Kaolin clay do, is, doesn't have any insecticidal properties. So it doesn't reduce the population um, directly uh, like GF120 or Danatol will. Um, it can be very effective. I do know that from feedback, um, some growers don't like the fact that it makes their trees look white or, or you know, tannish and no longer have green trees. Um, you do need to remove the kaolin clay before processing into oil. Um, and uh, you do need to have very good coverage, which can become expensive, but it is an alternative to applying pesticides. So you have to weigh out what is it that your orchard needs um, and, and decide what works for your orchard. Um, but feedback I've received from people in the North Coast, which is where I'm at, um, that, ha that have used kale and clay or do use kale and clay, they have been happy with it um, and not minded, you know, how it changes the color of the trees or having to remove it before processing. Um, but it is an option and it is on the UCANR IPM page um, that I mentioned. <clears throat> 